Well, if it hasn't been said enough, happy Mother's Day to everyone this morning. I'm looking forward to this Mother's Day because I'm gonna take a nap. <laughs> I'm of the age <laughs> that when you ask me what I wanna do, I'm gonna tell you I wanna take a nap. We might have wiener schnitzel again and a nap. That sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> you know, Mother's Day, didn't used to be so exciting after Steve and I lost our first child. Mother's Day was horrendous. We lost our first baby and two days later we went to Walt Disney World if you can imagine. Walt Disney World is not fun when you have just lost your first child. We went to Epcot, I remember we were down there for ministry and um, we went to Epcot and right outside Epcot well, there was this uh, field of sunflowers. And so Steve and I stood in this field of sunflowers and they took our picture. And that picture is a reminder to me of just a hard time in our lives. A few years ago, probably about eight years ago, maybe even longer than that, my five or three kids, the five original Blands were in Florida. And I said, I want to go to Epcot to that very same place and I want to take a picture. We got to Epcot and um, you have to have a ticket to get in. So, you know, it was going to cost me $1,000 just to get in and take a picture. And so Elliot said, Mom, just cry. Cry. <laughs> so I, uh, I implored the ticket agent. I said, I, I told him the whole story. I said, I just want to go to this spot, take a picture, and we'll leave. And we did just that. We went into Epcot to that very same place. The flowers are different. The place is different. And my heart was different. Because I was able to stand in that place with my three kids. And a place that was so difficult for me brought me such joy because God had redeemed my life and I now had three kids. Butler and I were talking on the way up to Fowler and we're gonna go to Florida. <laughs> Next summer, not this summer. Everybody, the weeks, the other blands, us. And don't you know, I'm gonna take all five of my grandkids with my three kids and my two new kids, Josh and Butler, and I'm gonna stand in that very same place and I'm gonna take a picture and I'm gonna be so thankful for what God has done and how God has redeemed my life. God is in the redeeming business. If today you find yourself in a difficult place, if today is not a day of celebration, let me tell you from example, God redeems and there is hope for you today. We are gonna continue our Thirsty series this morning. Pastor Peter did such a great job last week in uh, starting our series, and we're going to continue today. But let me ask you a question. Can you remember a time when you were really, really, really thirsty? Mine is just three minutes ago. <laughs> I just say thirsty, and you're like, hmm, I need a drink. Like you're going to die of thirst. Have you ever said that? Oh, I'm going to die of thirst. You're not going to die of thirst because you know how, it t how you die of thirst? It takes three days, pretty much. Three days of no liquid to die of thirst. So I don't think any of us can uh, say with assurance that we're going to die of thirst. Two of my favorite drinks. I'm going to tell you two of my favorite drinks. It's, don't worry, I'm A.G. The first, I signed on the dotted line. My first favorite drink is, and, and women may relate to this better than men. My first favorite drink is after my C-sections, they brought in this big juice, cranberry juice with the really good hospital ice. That drink is the best drink right on the face of the, you don't have to have a C-set, just giving birth, because you, and they bring you in this cranberry juice. Number one favorite drink. 
I was reminded of it after my surgery. They said, do you want a drink? I said, yeah, I want cranberry juice with hospital eyes. So I, I was able to have it. My second favorite drink is the Agua Frescas that you get at the Orange County Fair with the chamoy and the tajin, okay? It's the best $50 that you will spend for a drink. <laughs> it's true. It's not 50, it's 30. It might be $50 this year. And the man's going to buy it for me because I have to have it. <laughs> I have to have it. Do you like that? Anybody like those? Okay, the top 10 beverages consumed by Americans. Number 10, energy drinks. Number nine, coconut water. It's like drinking suntan oil. It's, it's Josh's joke. Number eight is milk. Good. All right. And then for you alkies out there, number seven is wine. Number six is beer. <laughs> Margaritas aren't on this list. I just don't understand people. Number five soft drinks. The number one selling soft drink? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Yeah, you Pepsi people just get over it. Just get over it. <laughs> All right, number five, soft drinks. Number four, coffee. Number three, fruit juice. Number two, tea. Number one is water. The number one drink. Now, listen, we're, we're really not a thirsty people. Think about it, especially now, because I can look through. We've got Stanleys and Hydro Flasks. There is never a time, even the children have little Stanleys and Hydro Flasks. My pantry at the house is like a warehouse of used Hydro Flasks and Stanleys. Now, I do like my Stanley, because it keeps my, I would love to tell you water cold, but it's not. I'm not, I'm not even going to fake. It keeps my iced tea cold. It, it just does. And our water, can you think? I think about the bougie of our water. I drank out of a hose growing up. If you're in my area, can you just taste the hot plastic as it comes out of the hose? It was the best thing ever. It was the best thing ever. We drank, it's a wonder we're alive. We drank out of the tap. He drinks out of the tap every morning when he takes his pills, his old man pills. You know, he's pulling it up and he's still alive. But you know, we have sparklets, we have bottled water, you know, all, we're so bougie. We don't even understand what it's like to be really thirsty. We're endangering our environment with all of the plastic bottles. The poor turtles will never, ever be able to survive because of all the plastic bottles we use just for water. Pastor Steve had the opportunity to go to Sri Lanka and see a group of people who are so thirsty that they're drinking dirty water. And they're sick and they're dying. And this is just for free because we as a church are going to join together and we are going to collect a lot of money to send to Sri Lanka. All you bougie people, get your wallets out because we're gonna send money to Sri Lanka so that they can have filtered, clean water. So just get ready, it's coming. We are a blessed and really non-thirsty people. We're spoiled. So today I want to look at a woman who is really thirsty, very thirsty. And the story is found in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. But today I'm not going to read the scripture to you. We're going to watch the story unfold on the screen. Would you 
give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come out now in the heat. So you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I'd, I'd still like a drink of water if, if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Wrong story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know, Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah, exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit, and the time is coming and is now here that it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And 
To this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. And you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon. Just the heart. <laughs> you promise. I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ. <laughs> <laughs> You forgot your um. Rabbi, we've got food. What would you like? Ah, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Who got you food? Wait a minute. You told her, mm -hmm. and she can tell others what food. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Y you told her who you are? Mm -hmm. So does that mean? It means we're going to stay here a couple of days. It's been a long time of sowing, but the fields are ripe for harvest. And so it's time. Let's go. Yes! <laughs> Having somebody read it, man. There's just a few things I want to take away from this incredible story this morning. First of all, I want us to think about the Samaritan woman's pedigree. I want to look at her pedigree. When a Samaritan woman, Bible says, she was known as a Samaritan. The word pedigree is usually associated with the wealthy but it has to do with where we come from. Has anybody done Ancestry.com? Well, I have, yeah. You gotta be careful with Ancestry.com because you're gonna find out things that older generations wanted to hide. I had a really good friend that went on Ancestry.com and she found out that she actually attended her parents' wedding. Like she was here before they got married. Didn't know that. In Ancestry.com, there's a little leaf that'll jiggle to tell you you have a clue of who you are. And then you hit on the leaf and then it'll take you down a path of all of your relatives. It was very helpful for Steve and I when we were in Scotland not too long ago because I was able to go to Ancestry and trace all of my relatives and I was able to find where they lived and where they were buried and it's just something to know who you are and where you come from. The Samaritan woman was known by the fact that she lived in Samaria. Now Samaritans and the Jewish people did not get along so we have to understand that the Samaritans, they believed in God, but they just didn't worship the way that the Jewish people 
worshiped. The root of the contention between the Jewish people and the Samaritans was a place of worship. A place of worship. Jews worshiped in Jerusalem and Samaritans worshiped in Samaria and neither one of them approved of the other. In fact, so much so that they hated each other. Her pedigree was not a good pedigree, so she was told. She was of people that Jesus himself, the Jewish people, would avoid going to the land where she lived. She did not have what we would call an honorable pedigree. So this morning, I want to ask you, is your lineage lacking a little bit? Is your ancestry a mess? Are you from what you would consider the wrong side of the tracks? I grew up thinking that we were something else. I thought we were the richest people that there ever were. And that's because of my mother. She never let me know how poor and how desolate we really were. Right? What is your pedigree? What does ancestry say about you? Her pedigree said she was of no value. She was so much of no value that Jesus should not have even drank out of the vessel that she had because he would have been contaminated. Let me give you a little leaf clue this morning to your ancestry. This leaf's going to tell you that you are a sinner saved by grace. That's your pedigree. That's my pedigree. I am a sinner saved by grace. So this morning, I want to stop right here streaming. I want to ask you, are you a sinner saved by grace? Have you made that decision? I want us to take a moment. I want us to close our eyes. And if you have not made that decision, but you would like to change that clue in your ancestry, if you would like to change your pedigree, if you would like to be known as a sinner saved by grace, a Christ follower, one who has eternal life, I simply want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come down front. I simply want you to raise your hand and we're going to pray. Lord, I thank you this morning. I thank you that you change our lives. You change our history. You change our ancestry. That you are the only one that matters. That you have called us and that you have offered us salvation. God, I ask this morning for those who've raised their hands, God, that you would come into their lives. As they claim, as they proclaim, Jesus, I want you to be a part of my life. I want a new history. I want a fresh start, a new future. God, I thank you that you come and that you offer salvation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. If you made that choice this morning, it doesn't stop here. I want to meet with you. The staff would like to meet with you and just give you a little bit more of what is to come, the next step. Online streaming audience, if you made a decision, call the office and we will help you with the next steps. Your pedigree is a sinner, sinner saved by grace. Let's look at our prejudice. Her pedigree wasn't that great, but let's look at her prejudice. The Samaritan woman said to him, this is John 4 verse 9, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans or even use the same dishes as Samaritans. Prejudiced. Prejudice is defined as this. A preconceived opinion that is, ba that is not based on reason or actual experience. Prejudice is defined as a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. 
The Samaritan woman knew the sting of prejudice. We talk about prejudice, we automatically think our mind goes to racism. She understood that too. But prejudice, my friends, see, you don't get off that easy. Because it would be easy for us to say, well, I'm not racist. But can you actually stand and say, I'm not prejudiced? Because prejudice includes so much more than just skin color. Prejudice includes so much more than a different religion or a different generation. The Jews were taught to despise despise the Samaritans. And the split between, because they were all Jewish people, the split happened because of a political decision. Believe it or not, a taxation situation. It happened during the reign of after David's son Solomon. Solomon died and his sons to take over. And the elders tell him to let go of a taxation. But his buddies say you should add more to it. And he does exactly what his buddies want, not what the elders want. This is the Karen version, so don't, uh, don't go looking it up. <laughs> there are 12 tribes at this time, right? 12 tribes of Israel. Two tribes decide to stay in Judea, and that's where Jerusalem is. They're going to hang tight. The other ten say, we're getting out of Dodge. It's too much. I can't do it. And they go to Israel. And then they begin to intermarry, and it all becomes a mess. So you have the Jewish people, the remnant of Judah and Benjamin, who stay in Judea. And then you have the rest, the other 10 tribes, who are in Israel. And they are taught to hate one another. Hmm. You might be sitting there thinking, you know, how foolish that was. Why they wouldn't just stay. How ridiculous. It's, it's easy for us sometimes to look at the stories in the Bible because we know the end of the story and make our conclusions about it. But generations are taught to hate. You might think it may not happen here, but let's talk about the Civil War. We're all Americans. We all live in the United States of America. But the North said... It's wrong to own another person, especially a person of color. The South said, you're crazy. It's okay to own a person of color. The United States of America, North and South. Don't tell me they didn't hate each other. I wasn't alive then, but... You've seen the footage, you've, you, you've read the stories, you know the history. We have been taught to hate. There's a song from uh, South Pacific, the musical South Pacific, and it says this. You have to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear, you've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of peoples whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. We would be wrong to stand and say that we've not been taught to hate. I think that we have been. I know that there's redemption and I know I, I would like to say that I have the answer to it all, right? But I, I can't stand as a white woman and tell you that the struggles 
of my fellow Christians in this congregation who are not the same color as me, are not the same sex as me, and are not the same gen uh, generation as me, have not struggled. Jesus went beyond that hate. Of course he didn't hate, but he picked her. He chose her. We have political divisions. We have religious divisions. We sit in here as Assembly of God Pentecostal people, and we think we have all the answers. We certainly have more answers than our poor, fooled Catholic friends who are across the street having mass and doing, you know, those poor people. There's a division, a religious division. I worship in Jerusalem, you worship in Samaria, and your worship isn't as value as my worship, right? Political religious, we have theological divisions for Pete's sake. We can argue about what version of the Bible is the more accurate. How about if we just argue or in, encourage one another to read the Bible? I don't care what version you read. I don't care, it's all the word of God, unless it's the Gen Z Bible, now that one we just can't do, I mean. Read the word. The thing here with prejudice that we have to remember is division. Why don't we take the time to follow in Jesus' footsteps and break down the walls of division? Right? The prejudice among the unsaved can be explained, but in the case of Christians, there's, there's no explanation. There's no explanation. Let's take a moment and pray. Jesus, this morning, as we discuss these different attributes of the story, especially this morning, I want to take a moment and pray for unity. I want to pray against the walls of prejudice. I want to pray against the division that the enemy tries to put in our lives and in our sanctuary, God. I just pray that the unifying spirit, that your spirit will unify us, Lord God, that we know that we are neither, uh, we are not divided by our age, by our gender, by our religion, by our skin color, but we are one. Lord God, we are one body. We are a group of believers. And La Palma Christian Center this morning stands united, united in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. We learn from her pedigree. We learn from her prejudice. We can even learn from her promiscuity. This chick, she was not an example of purity. That is for sure. He we know that Jesus in uh, John 4, 16, 18 said, go call your husband and have him come back. She said, I have no husband. And Jesus replied to her and said, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five of them and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said, just said is quite true. We've all made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. There might be abuse in our past. We may have been in an abusive, we might, some of you might right now be in an abusive relationship. Maybe you have lost your identity. God has created us to need each other and his purpose is pure. And the enemy is relentless to destroy relationships. Don't be fooled. He wants to destroy relationships. And Jesus knew that day who he would meet at the well. He knew her past. He knew what she had done, but Jesus chose her. If you're here this morning and you feel like he wouldn't choose me, let me assure you that he will, and he does, and he has. He is in the redeeming business. Her pedigree was horrible. Her prejudice was great. Her promiscuity was off the charts. But let me 
tell you a little bit about her promise. Jesus gave her a promise, first of all, of living water, eternal life. John 4, 10 through 14 says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and even his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Can you imagine as she, I mean, you can't imagine because Dallas Jenkins helps us to imagine as he begins to explain to her, I have water that will help you to never thirst again. She was going to the well in the heat of the day because of prejudice, not because of the prejudice of the Jews, but because of the prejudice of the women in the village who were so much better than her, who had so much more of a handle on life, who talked about her, who made fun of her, who probably, can you imagine, made her life miserable? Nobody likes to be around people who make fun of you. I don't. I don't want to hang out with you if you're going to make fun of me. I'll just be honest, it hurts my feelings. Don't make fun of people. A joke about somebody to get a quick laugh is wrong. What if we quit doing that? What if we quit making fun of one another? Do you think unity would come into the house? Do you think that there would be more breakthroughs? The time we spend making fun of one another and tear, you know why you do that? Do you know why you make fun of other people? Because it makes you feel better about yourself. What if we speak actually blessing over each other? Next time you want to go and make fun of somebody, why don't you go and say, hey, can I pray with you? Let's pray today. What can I pray with you about? Blessing and cursing. Sometimes we think cursing that comes out of our mouth is something that's just so vulgar and so mean. Cursing could be as little as making fun of somebody. Don't always try to find the joke. Why don't you always try to find the blessing? Let's try to find the good thing. Let's speak life. Let's speak living water. This poor woman had lived a life. We don't know why she had suffered we don't know why. We don't know why she had been through so many men. I don't know why some of you have suffered. I don't know why your life is the way it is. I don't know. He does. He does. And he went to a place that he shouldn't be. The disciples were ticked off at him because they didn't want to be there. And he made a point to go to that very well at that time of the day to meet her in her sin and in her discouragement. And even when he began to tell her about her sin, he did it in an encouraging way. He did it in a way that said, I know, but it's okay. I know that there's five. And the one you're with right now, you don't even know his name. But listen, I have water for you that you don't know. I offer you living water. I offer you eternal life. Then he give her, gives her a promise of borderless worship. He says, in verse 19, we'll continue. It says, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors, ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. 
Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. He says, listen, don't worry about it. Jerusalem or Samaria doesn't matter anymore. The place doesn't matter. The place where you worship doesn't matter. What matters is your heart in spirit and in truth. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry that you're not welcome in Jerusalem. You don't have to worry that you're not allowed to go to the temple in Jerusalem because I'm telling you that I am going to make it to where you worship in spirit and truth no matter where you are. No matter what building you're in, no, what, no matter what country, no matter, borderless. Wouldn't it be free just to be borderless? We hear so much about borders, 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 borders. This is borderless. There are no restraints. There are no limits to our worship. This woman was bound to an area because of hatred. And Jesus said, there's no more borders. Your worship is no matter where you're at, it doesn't matter. She had a promise of living water, borderless worship, and a promise of the Messiah. This was a big one. And I, as a woman, I love Jesus' treatment of women. Because he always chose to let the really big things be found out by a woman first. The woman said in verse 25, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, well, I'm the one speaking to you. I'm he. It's in verse 25. So of all the people up until this time, and in the video you see Peter, he's like, you told her? He's been waiting this entire time. The disciples, they've all been waiting for Jesus to finally reveal who he is to somebody else so they can begin the work. So here are the disciples ticked off that they have to be in Samaria, ticked off that they have to waste their time in an area of hated people. And Jesus says, and lets the cat out of the bag, if you will, that I am he. I'm the Christ. And listen, if you'll notice, she knew, a Samaritan knew that there was a promised Messiah. So that lets you know they weren't as bad as everybody said. She knew that there was a Messiah because as soon as he said that and he said, I am the Christ, she's like, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. He let a woman, a Samaritan, in Samaria, who had five previous relationships, living with another man who was really of no account, no value in that day and age, he chose her. He revealed himself to her. So why would we reject him? This morning, no matter what situation you find yourself in, Jesus chooses you. Jesus chose you. Amen. Plain and simple. Oh, but I, I have done this and, I, and, and I, I, you don't understand. Jesus chooses you. Oh, but you know, I just, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I, I, I've been married and then divorced. Yeah. Jesus chooses you. Man, woman, child, Jesus chooses you. And finally, we got to look at her proclamation because all of a sudden it hits. Wait a minute. You're the Christ. 
And I have been told a secret that nobody knows. Verse 27 says it this way. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jug, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Verse 39 goes on to say, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his word, words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard it for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. She left her burden at the well. She left her insignificance behind. She left her excuses behind. She left her shame behind. And she told her entire village Even those skanky women who were making fun of her and made her life so miserable, she told them, come see a man. Come see a man who told me everything I've ever done, but gave me a promise, a promise of life, a promise of hope, a promise of eternal life. You're not going to believe it. And I can imagine just at the the change in her countenance. She was no longer beat down. She was no longer ashamed. She was no longer carrying the burden of what her life had brought her to. But God, in his great mercy, caused her to come to a well at a certain time of the day when his beautiful son would be waiting for her. What do you have to leave behind today? What have you brought in with you? This this is a simple, simple message, a simple encouragement. What do you bring to the well in the middle of the afternoon? What do you think about in the middle of the night? What do you worry about before you get out of the car and walk across the parking lot to the sanctuary? What are you carrying that you shouldn't be carrying? What have you been carefully taught to hate? What prejudice do you hold on to in your heart? This morning, it's simple. All you have to do is come to a well and meet a savior who will change your life forever. That's where it starts. But after your life's changed, that's when you get to proclaim. And ladies, this morning, I want to give a special encouragement to all of you. Because Jesus could have told the disciples. He could have told Peter. He could have told John. He could have encouraged them to be the ones to go and share the story. But he didn't. He chose a woman. And he chose a woman that had a lot of baggage. So no matter where you're all at in life, no matter what you're holding on to, Jesus chooses you. Jesus chooses you. No matter what your family situation is, no matter if the kids are tearing you up, no matter if the kids don't serve God, no matter, no matter, no matter what, Jesus chooses you. He chooses you, and he requires one thing of you. Go and tell. Go and proclaim. So this morning, as you leave, I want you to be encouraged, but I want you to leave here, and I want you to proclaim. Come see a man who told me everything I was. Come see a man. Come meet a man who knew how dark my heart was, who knew how dark my life is, but chose me.
because her words not only changed her family, but her words changed an entire village, an entire nation of Samaria. Jerusalem, at this point in time, didn't want anything to do with Jesus. You know, the golden people, the chosen people, they didn't, they, they didn't care to know the Messiah. He was in Samaria. He wasn't welcome in Jerusalem, but Samaria welcomed him and they were changed because of his confidence in one woman. Go ahead and stand this morning. Streaming audience, I'm so glad that you are with us. We, I want to wish you a happy Mother's Day.